Okay. Good evening, everybody. Before I begin, let me first thank Ifai and Cosmo Kaisha for inviting me here to speak with you today. And let me also thank all of you for coming and taking time out of your evening to come and hear about something very strange like dark matter. And also let me apologize that uh, what I know of Spanish and Catalan is even less than we know about dark matter, and so I have to deliver the talk to you in English. Okay, uh, this is the end of the talk. Uh, this is the bottom line, right? Uh, which is the following, I'll give it away. Uh, astronomers and physicists today believe that all of the forms of matter that are familiar to us, that make up our material world, Right, our material world is made up of atoms, protons, neutrons, electrons, that all of this comprises only 5% of the composition of the universe. There is five times as much matter in the universe that is made of some material called dark matter, five times more than all of this normal matter. Okay. This has never been seen in a laboratory. It's completely invisible, and it's able to pass through the entire Earth without leaving a trace. Okay. This sounds crazy, I know, but I hope that by the end of the hour, I can convince you that there is good reason to believe that this exists. Now, even stranger still, there's another material called dark energy, which behaves with repulsive gravity that's been discovered and we believe comprises the other two-thirds of the universe. Now, I'm going to talk to you today about this one. And you'll have to come back in two weeks to hear Dr. Eisenstein talk about the, the more difficult one, which is uh, dark energy. So today, dark matter. All right, so how would you convince yourself that there's something invisible in the universe? Uh, there is a, uh, an old movie that was made from a famous book by H.G. Wells that is, has a scene where footprints appear in the snow, but we cannot see anybody making them. So in this case, you could infer the presence of the invisible man by the effect that he's having on the part of the world that you can see. Right? So our job today in looking for invisible matter in the universe is to find some kind of footprints, some impact on the things we can see. And if the explanation that there is invisible matter is less crazy than any other explanation of the <coughs> footprints, we will accept that as the way to go. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the visible universe. This is what the visible universe looked like in 1609. In this year, Galileo had just turned the telescope to the heavens for the first time. So until this time, everything that we knew about the universe was what could be seen with the naked eye. And when you look up in the sky, what do you see? You see a few thousand stars that seem to hold a fixed pattern in constellations. And then, wandering among those fixed stars are seven objects. They seem to move among the stars. Now, the seven days of the week are named after these seven classical planets. And Copernicus had already shown at that time that the arrangement of these things was as shown here, which is that the sun is in the middle, uh, and the Earth, which is not among these, orbits the sun, along with Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and the moon orbits the Earth. Now, it was a problem for millennia to understand why these seven moving objects would follow the patterns that they did across the sky. It was very difficult to predict or even to look back at the old records and explain them to great accuracy. In the year 1609, the first accurate explanation for the uh, motion of the planets was offered by Johannes Kepler. And he said that he could explain all the motions of the planets by assuming that each planet followed an elliptical path around the sun. Now, a circle is a special case of an ellipse. 
most of the planets happen to go on ellipses that are very close to circles. So for millennia before this, people were obsessed with, were, were distracted by trying to have the sun, the, the planets follow circular orbits. But the ellipses fixed everything. And this was a great triumph for Kepler, but one thing that he didn't tell us is why would a planet choose to go on an ellipse instead of a circle or some other shape? And the answer to that, well, he offered some answers for his theories, and they involved some very strange mechanisms of planets on spheres that were outside of polyhedra. The kind way to put it is that history doesn't pay that much attention to this anymore. We thank Kepler for his laws and leave it at that. All right. We needed a better explanation for the laws of motion. And this was offered by perhaps one of the greatest scientists of all times. Right? In 1680, Isaac Newton was able to show that an elliptical orbit is exactly what would be predicted from a very simple law of gravitational attraction between the sun and each planet. Okay? So he was not only to say, yes, there are ellipses, but he told us that gravity causes the ellipses. So that was fantastic. We had an explanation for the motion of the planets. But there was a problem. The planet Saturn did not follow the ellipse. It was deviating from the path predicted by Kepler. So did this mean that this theory of gravity of Newton's must be wrong because it predicts something incorrect? Well, in fact, uh, Newton was able to turn this problem and say, no, this is not a problem. This is actually a triumph of my theory. Because Newton's theory of gravity says that, yes, the sun pulls on Saturn and makes Saturn go in an ellipse. And yes, say the sun pulls on Jupiter and pulls, puts Jupiter on an ellipse. But according to Newton, gravity is a universal force that every bit of matter in the universe pulls on every other bit of matter. So not only is Saturn being pulled by the sun, but Saturn is also being pulled by Jupiter as well as every other planet. And it's this tug of Jupiter on Saturn, Newton was able to demonstrate that that exactly explained the deviations that had been seen in Saturn's orbit. So the universal gravitation law was very successful. All right, let's jump forward 100 years to this gentleman, Sir William Herschel. He was scanning the, the heavens with the telescope and he discovered a new planet, the first ever seen beyond the ones visible to the naked eye. Now, he named this planet Georgium Cetus in honor of his king, but the rest of the world didn't think that was a very good idea and came up with the name Uranus instead. And by 100 years later, even the English were willing to call this planet Uranus instead of George. Now, why is this of interest to us? Well, 50 years after this discovery, by 1830, it was also clear that Uranus was not following the elliptical path. Now, part of the reason it wasn't following the elliptical path is because Jupiter and Saturn are pulling on it, but that was not enough to explain the deviation of Uranus's orbit. There was an unexplained motion of Uranus. By the 1840s, several astronomers had the, several, the same idea, which is maybe there is an unseen planet, one that we haven't discovered yet, and that planet is pulling Uranus off of its track. So the English astronomer Charles Couch Adams and the French astronomer Urbain Leverrier, they both were able to predict where on this sky this undetected planet would have to be in order to pull Uranus on the path that we saw. <laughs> so Le Verrier sent his prediction to some German astronomers and they looked on the sky and within days they had found the object that we now call Neptune. So here's a map of the sky and this is a very small fraction of the sky. You can see here this is only one degree on the sky, you know, about this much. Uh, and here's where Le Verrier said to find Neptune, there's where Adam said to find it. And there's where the astronomers actually found Neptune. Very close. Uh, just as a curiosity, Neptune is so far from the sun that it was only in 2011, 160 something years after its discovery, that Neptune completed its first circle around the sun and returned to the place of its discovery. 
All right, but what's most interesting here is that Neptune is our first example of dark matter, right? <laughs> Neptune was invisible before it was discovered. It wasn't discovered by accident. We inferred its presence because of its footprints, right? Its footprints being the unexplained motion of Uranus in this case. So this was a, a great triumph, right? Uh, and Neptune, of course, it's not invisible. It's not dark, it's merely dim. So we could have seen Neptune earlier if we had looked in the right place. We just didn't know where to look until this prediction. Okay. Okay. But the lesson that we should keep here is that we were looking for footprints of invisible matter and gravity, gravity is the footprint that we're gonna use, right? Now, if matter's invisible, it still pulls, according to universal gravitation, that still pulls on everything around it. So we're gonna look for places where there's an unexplained motion and we're gonna see if we can explain that by some new kind of matter or if we need a new kind of matter to explain it. All right, so this idea was very powerful and it was very successful for Le Verrier. He became famous, right? And so he uh, looked at one of the other planets, Mercury. So here's Mercury going in its elliptical orbit around the sun, but every time it goes around, its orbit twists a little bit, which is called precession. Now this is not what Kepler said would happen. But if we take account of the other planets, we expect this to happen a little bit. But even taking account of the other planets' influence on Mercury, astronomers were not able to explain the amount of what we call the precession of Mercury. Uh, so Le Verrier, having made his fortune by predicting one additional planet, said, I'll try this again. Let me imagine, let's assume that perhaps the problem with Mercury is that there's another planet between Mercury and the Sun. And this planet even had a name, Planet Vulcan. Now this planet would be very hard to find because it would be close to the Sun and it would be usually lost in the light of the Sun. Nonetheless, when Le Verrier made his prediction, many people claimed to have found it. Unfortunately, none of them ever found it in the same place. These, these, these uh, measurements were not confirmed. And what eventually happened was a totally different resolution 100 years ago, this year, Albert Einstein published his theory of general relativity. And in this theory, he says that Newton's laws of gravitation are close to correct, but not quite. There is a little change in, in general relativity. And Einstein was able to show that the switch from, from Newton's gravity to general relativity precisely explained this extra motion of Mercury. So in this case, all those observers who thought they had seen this missing planet were just wrong, which is something we should take to heart sometimes. When you're looking for something, you'll see it, even if it's not there. Important lesson. Uh, but another lesson here is that in this case, the extra motion was not due to some unseen matter like Neptune. In this case, it was the theory of gravity that had to change. All right, so let me review the outcomes of the unexplained motions in the solar system. Today, there are no unexplained motions in the solar system. We can predict the positions of the planets to incredible accuracy, to, a, to an accuracy of only a few meters for most of the planets. Uh, and that's how we're able to, say, land spacecraft on them, for example. So in the solar system, everything makes sense. But let's remember that to get to this point, we had three unexplained motions, and one of them the unexplained motion of Uranus led to the discovery of a new object, Neptune. But in two other cases, when Saturn was moving and when Mercury was moving in an unexplained way, it was actually the theory of gravity that we had to change to make sense of this. Okay, okay. so let's move outside of the solar system now in search of unexplained motions. The first person to ever use the phrase dark matter in an astronomical publication was this gentleman, Fritz Zwicky. He was a Swiss-born astronomer who worked in California in the United States. And uh, he was observing what we call clusters of galaxies. Uh, and this is a picture of a cluster of galaxies. Each of these red fuzzy blobs is a galaxy and there is a bunch of them in one place so we just call this a cluster. Here is the front page of 
Dr. Zwicky's publication. Now this was in 1937, which was the first time he published this in English, so I'm using this one instead of 1933. But if we just look at the title here, it says, On the Masses of Nebulae and Clusters of Nebulae. Now nebulae was the word that was used in the 30s to mean galaxies. It's the same thing. So he's going to somehow tell us something about the mass that's in an entire galaxy. And what does he tell us if we look a few pages down? Uh, up here, there is this scientific notation, and what he found is that the average one of those galaxies, the mass that he derived, was equivalent to 45 billion times the mass of the sun. And yet, when you look at each galaxy, and you ask how bright is it, how much light is it putting out, how many suns would it take to put out that much light, he got a very different answer of only 85 million stars appear to be in each galaxy. So notice that this is billion and this is million. And so what he <coughs> concluded is that there was 500 times more mass in each galaxy than there was a right to be. If the galaxy is made of normal stars like the sun, that doesn't work. There has to be 500 times more mass in some dark form. So this is why he posited dark matter. Now before we get further into this, I just want to give a little bit more background about what is a galaxy, what's a cluster of galaxies, and how did actually Zwicky come to this conclusion? <laughs> now the thing about astronomy is that everything is very big, unimaginably big. Right? So let's start, for example, with just a trip to the sun. The sun is 150 million kilometers away from Earth. So if you take a fast trip, say you book an Ave ticket to go to the sun, that trip would take you 57 years. Okay. If you want to go faster, the fastest you could possibly travel would be at the speed of light, which is 300,000 kilometers per second. Even at that fastest possible speed, the trip from here to the sun would take nine minutes. And if you wanted to go to the edge of the solar system, say to Neptune, that's a 30 times farther trip. That would be a 1700 year journey by Ave. And it's five hours even at the speed of light. So that's our solar system is pretty big. But our solar system is tiny to an astronomer because even the nearest star past the sun is 10,000 times farther away than Neptune. Right? The nearest star to the Earth is a four-year trip at the speed of light. Or we would say that it's four light years away from Earth. Okay. And that's just the nearest star. The Sun lives in the Milky Way galaxy, which is a spinning vast pancake of stars. Okay. So if we looked at the Milky Way from the side, this pancake would look very thin, and that pancake is almost 100,000 light years across. So again, another 10,000 or times so larger than the distance of the nearest star. These galaxies are vast. Okay. This is a picture to the next good-sized galaxy outside the Milky Way. This is our neighbor galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, and it's three million light years away. Okay. Each galaxy, like the Milky Way or Andromeda, contains roughly 10 billion stars. Okay, so these things are very big. There's a lot of room for, say, dark matter or something that we would not have noticed in our tiny little solar system. Now let's go back to Zwicky. Uh, he was looking at a cluster of galaxies. So what you could see here is this is one of these clusters. And each one of these yellow blobs here is a galaxy typically similar or larger in size to our Milky Way. And a good sized galaxy cluster would have a few hundred or a thousand of these galaxies all piled up in one part of the sky. So these are called galaxy clusters, and the one that Zwicky was looking at is 300 million light years away. Uh, and so altogether, this galaxy cluster is about 10 billion times larger than the solar system. Very large, unimaginably large, right? Okay, if uh, you could make a movie of a galaxy cluster instead of a still picture, this is what we think you would see, right? Each of the galaxies, they're circling the center of the cluster like a swarm of fireflies. They're in constant motion around each other. And if you look at the clock up here, you can see that uh, this is giga years, this is billions of years. And so it takes each galaxy 
roughly a billion years to circle around the center of the cluster. We are only blessed to live maybe a hundred years if you're lucky. So in a human lifetime, these galaxies would never move perceptibly far. We can't actually see the galaxies move. Uh, but we believe that they are buzzing around as in, shown in the movie here. Okay. All right, now I'm gonna show you the one formula, just one, okay, for the whole talk. One bit of algebra here. Uh, we know that we're gonna be looking for matter, and how do we find matter? We find it by gravity, it makes things move. Things normally want to move in straight lines, but these planets in the solar system, they're moving in their circles or ellipses because the sun is constantly pulling on them, right? These galaxies in the cluster, they're going in a circle around the cluster. Something has to be holding them into place. And we think that it's the gravity of all the other galaxies that's holding this thing together. Otherwise, it would just fly apart into space. This formula from Newton, which Einstein would approve of, this is still a good formula, tells you how you can figure out that mass. So if I have a galaxy that's going in a circle, and the circle has a radius r, and that galaxy is moving at some speed v, okay, then this is the mass of the matter that's holding it in place would be equal to v squared r divided by g. And g is just a number that Isaac Newton told us, right? So what do we know? We want to find this out. That means to use this recipe, we have to know these three things. Well, Newton told us what that is. It's easy to see how far away from the center each galaxy is, so r is easy. But how could Zwicky tell the speed of the galaxies when they do not perceptibly move over the lifetime of human civilization? Well, he used a common astronomer's trick called the Doppler shift. And instead of trying to explain that, I'm just going to demonstrate it for you. Okay. So I'm going to turn this buzzer on. It sounds like a fire alarm. It's not. Okay, don't run away. Uh, and here it is. Okay. This beeper is emitting a constant pitch. But now let me turn it back on. And I'm going to swing it around my head. And then I'm going to swing it faster. And I just want you to listen. Okay. And we'll speed up. Okay. Can you hear any difference? Sometimes the acoustics in the room are not good. Okay. You hear the pitch of the buzzer going up, down, up, down, up, down every time it spins around. And the faster it spins, the more the pitch changes. Okay. This is a Doppler effect. It's very familiar. If you stand next to a train track or hear an ambulance go by, you know that the pitch changes as the object goes by you. Right. And you, wouldn't like, you could close your eyes and you could tell that the buzzer was moving, right? You don't have to see it moving. Just listening to the pitch change would tell you how fast I'm spinning the buzzer. Well, the same thing works with light, except light doesn't have pitch. Light instead has color. So when something's moving towards you, it looks bluer. When it's moving away from you, it looks redder. Zwicky was able to carefully measure the colors of each of those spiral galaxies and figure out how fast they're moving. And the answer was surprisingly fast, shockingly fast, a thousand kilometers per second, typically. And when he plugged those numbers into that formula, that's when he found that the mass in the cluster was 500 times more than the stars, the normal matter should account for. Okay. So this is a great mystery. How can we deal with this paradox of Zwicky's? We have a number of choices. The first choice is to say, well, maybe he just measured it wrong. Maybe, you know, he stayed up too late one night or whatever. So uh, that, though, is not a good option. That doesn't work because many people have repeated this measurement many times on many clusters, and they all get the same answer, too much mass. Okay. Maybe th the galaxies aren't really circling because we didn't actually have time to watch that. Maybe the galaxy cluster really is coming apart. Okay. Well, for a number of reasons, we don't think that's the right answer either, because if the galaxy clusters were coming apart, we'd have a hard time explaining why we still see so many of them. Okay. Uh, what if there's a lot of normal matter, you know, atoms, right, normal stuff, that's not in stars. It's in some other form that doesn't emit as much light as a star does. Okay. Well, this, in fact, turns out to be true, that most of the matter in a galaxy cluster is in the form of a very dilute hot gas that lives between the stars. 
And so it does not put out any light that Zwicky could have seen. Okay. So in some sense, that is dark matter. But these very hot atoms that live between the stars, they actually emit X-rays, another form of light. And since the 1960s, we've been able to put X-ray telescopes up in space above the atmosphere. And when you point one at a galaxy cluster, it's glowing with X-rays. So yes, there is a lot of matter there. It's normal matter, it's not dark. But unfortunately, even when you add up this extra mass, uh, it's still not enough to make the mass that Zwicky saw there. Right? So now we believe that there's maybe five or six times too much mass in the cluster, not just five, uh, not 500 times, but still, we have a dark matter problem. Okay. So what answers could we possibly uh, have left? Well, one would be that there's a whole new kind of matter that doesn't emit light at all. That would be a very crazy idea in 1933. Another is that the law of gravity is wrong, which would also be a pretty dramatic answer. And uh, at the time, astronomers were not ready for this kind of thing, and so they took option six, which was just, this is too weird, I don't want to think about it, okay? And so Zwicky's paper was essentially ignored for about 40 years, okay? But by the 1970s, this was getting hard to ignore because people had seen other unexplained motions. So for example, uh, Vera Rubin, an American astronomer, was looking at spiral galaxies like our Milky Way. And these spiral galaxies spin. They're a spinning pancake of stars. So we can use the same Doppler shift trick uh, on the side coming towards us. The stars look a little bluer. On the side moving away from us, the stars look a little redder. Okay? We can figure out how fast they're moving, what the radius is, use the formula. Bang, we have the, the mass of the spiral galaxy. Okay. This is the result. Okay. Uh, this is a typical spiral galaxy. And as we look farther and farther away from the center of the galaxy, at some point, the stars basically run out. Okay. And so what we expect to see is that as we get farther and farther past the edge of the stars, if there's no additional matter, the, the rotation speed of the galaxy should slow down. But what Vera Rubin and others saw is that they could go farther and farther away from the center of the galaxy and see the same speed. So if this is the same speed and this keeps getting bigger, the mass just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So the conclusion that we have to draw is that what we see of a spiral galaxy is actually only a little bit of what's there. That every galaxy full of stars is actually surrounded by a much larger, much more massive, what we call halo of some kind of dark matter that we don't see. Okay. Furthermore, we live in a spiral galaxy, right? We live in the Milky Way. We're here. You know, we're going around. What this means is that we are swimming in a sea of dark matter. It's passing through us all the time, and somehow we manage to never notice that, right? If the dark matter is everywhere, it's here, but we have not noticed that it's among us before. So this means that dark matter, it has to be made of a particle that's not only invisible, but is extremely inert, that it can pass through us. There are millions of them passing through us every second, if this is true. We never feel them, and in fact, they pass through Earth without any effect whatsoever. So this has to be a very unusual kind of matter, not just dark, but inert. Another crazy idea, right? This is just getting stranger, okay? So let's take a slight detour. Instead of talking about very big things, let's talk about what happens to individual particles, right? What would make a particle dark or inert? Well, uh, what's normal matter made out of? It's made out of molecules, and molecules are made out of atoms, and most of us have learned that an atom is made of electrons that are circling a nucleus made out of protons and neutrons, and uh, our friends in the high energy at if, uh, if I will tell us that the, the protons and neutrons are made of quarks. Okay. And quarks and electrons push and pull on each other. How do they do that? Well, one electron might just be wandering along and decide to emit a little bit of light. And this little thing here, the squiggly line, is called a photon, and it's just a, a little particle of light. And when it spits that out, it recoils. Meanwhile, another electron is wandering by here, and it receives the photon and recoils. And, and 
by exchanging these little light messages, these light particles, that's how normal matter pushes and pulls on things. And if this electron is in the sun, and this one is in the retina of your eye, this is how we see the sun, right? This little message here traveled 150 million kilometers across space to get to your eye. So what we would need to have in order to explain the dark matter is some kind of particle, sorry, that does not speak photons. Okay. A new kind of part, which would have been a very strange idea. And yet, incident, interestingly enough, in the 1930s, the nuclear physicists had a dark matter problem of their own. Okay. In some nuclear reactions, they would see energy just disappear, and this is not supposed to happen. So they hypothesized maybe there's a particle which they named a neutrino, it had a name before it was actually seen, uh, that was carrying off this energy. So they had to invent themselves an invisible friend to understand these nuclear reactions. And interestingly enough, uh, it took 26 years, but in 1956, people were actually able to capture a, a, a neutrino and show that it existed. And the way that happened, here's a picture of one. Uh, this is a picture here where a proton was just sitting here minding its own business and then suddenly shoots off at high speed in this direction as do a couple of other subatomic particles made at the same time. Okay. Actually, this is the proton. And what we surmise happened here is that an invisible particle came in and slammed into the proton and sent it off. Okay. So here is direct evidence of the existence of neutrinos and for making this discovery, a Nobel Prize was awarded. Then, in 1968, deep underground, uh, another physicist named Ray Davies was able to show that we are constantly being bombarded from an intense stream of neutrinos that originates in the core of the sun, because the sun is fueled by these nuclear reactions. And then, just this year, the Nobel Prize was avoided for discoveries that the neutrinos carry a little bit of mass. So, it appears, first of all, that if you want, a Nobel, want to win a Nobel Prize, studying neutrinos is a pretty good way to do it, right? Uh, but it also appears that maybe these people, uh, these high energy physicists have solved our dark matter problem for us because this is just what the doctor ordered, right? This is a particle that does not emit or absorb light. It appears to travel, almost the vast majority of them travel straight through Earth without ever having been noticed. Right? We've been, we're being bombarded by solar neutrinos all the time, and it has mass. So maybe this is the, the dark matter. That would be great. But talk's not over yet, okay, because it didn't work. The, the neutrinos don't have enough mass. They are about 1% as massive as the normal matter in the universe. We need to come up with enough mass to be five times more than all the normal matter. So neutrinos, unfortunately, are too small to be our dark matter. But having discovered one particle that's mass, that's dark and inert, it's maybe now not such a crazy idea to think that there's another particle that we haven't discovered yet that could be our dark matter in, in the galaxies. Right? And so uh, this particle we call the weakly interacting massive particle or WIMP. Okay, this was some physicist joke about uh, 30 or 40 years ago, but uh, we're engaged in looking for WIMPs. So we think the universe, uh, that clusters of galaxies and our galaxies are filled with WIMPs, but we've never seen one in the laboratory. We have no particular uh, evidence in the lab that these exist. So it still falls. Now, if you come next week or in three weeks, you'll hear about attempts by people to create or capture a WIMP in the laboratory on Earth, okay? But that hasn't happened yet. So for now, it's just us astronomers who have to figure out everything about the dark matter. So I want to see if I can describe for you one other method that we can use to learn about the dark matter. Okay. And this one is my favorite because it's what I do. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk about this one for a while. So here's the idea. And uh, it's not my idea, okay, I don't want to give that impression or anything, but it's uh, an idea I was fond of. So uh, we've been looking for footprints of our dark matter by having it pull on some other thing that we can see, right? 
Well, you can ask yourself, because the dark matter has gravity, maybe it pulls not only on the matter, but would it bend the light itself as the light passed by? In other words, could one of those photons, as it passed by mass, would it bend or would it just go straight? So Newton's answer was the first one here, which he said, of course, gravity is universal. Everything pulls on everything else. So photons, light will be bent as it passes a massive object. But other people said, well, wait a minute, Isaac. Uh, photons, they actually don't have any mass. And in your formula for, uh, for gravity, you need mass to have a gravitational effect. So maybe they don't get bent. So this was actually an open question for centuries after Neptune, uh, after, sorry, not Neptune, after Newton. Uh, but again, the answer came in 1915 with general relativity. So I won't try to explain all of general relativity to you. You know, that's another lecture, right? Uh, but any of you probably know that Einstein said that gravity is not really pushing and pulling that what gravity is, is a, a bending, a, a warping of space. And we tend to draw these nice pictures here that here's some mass like the sun and, and the, uh, the space around it is bent uh, and that a photon, instead of going th straight through, would be deflected by traveling basically on a, a curved surface. So according to Einstein, the answer is yes, gravity will bend light. And he predicted exactly by how much. Okay. In fact, his prediction was different from Newton's. So he made this prediction. How could you test his prediction? So he gave the answer to that. He said, um, OK, what's the most massive thing in a neighborhood? What's the biggest mass around? Well, it's the sun. Okay. <coughs> let's see if the sun bends light. How could you tell? So let's imagine that we have some star up here, the silver one. And it's going to emit some light, a photon. Now, if there is no. If gravity does not bend light, that photon just travels on a straight line until it reaches our eye right here. Okay. But if Einstein is correct, this photon gets bent by the gravity of the sun, and it does not reach our eye. We don't see it. Okay. But there's another photon that left the star in this direction, and when it got bent, it did make it to our eye. So this is the one that we see, if Einstein is correct. And so it looks to us like the star is up here, because that's the direction that the light came from. Right? So what Einstein said is the following. If you had a bunch of stars here, the silver ones, and then I plop the sun down in the middle, then it will look to you like all the stars in the neighborhood move away from the sun by a small amount. And he predicted exactly how much they should move. Okay. So here's a test. Uh, but this is a very difficult task to do because you can't see the stars that are next to the sun, right? The sun is too bright. But there is one opportunity that we get to see the stars that are right next to the sun, measure them, and then the sun moves away and we look at them again. And that's during a total solar eclipse, when the moon comes and blocks the light of the sun. Suddenly, these stars become visible. And by good fortune, there was a total solar eclipse just a couple of years after Einstein published his theory of general relativity. And lo and behold, they observed these stars to be repelled, to move, apparently, exactly by the amount that Einstein predicted. And so this became front page news all over the world. Here's a headline from the front page of the New York Times uh, in 1919. Uh, and it says, don't worry, you know, the universe is still OK. but." Uh, there's this guy, Einstein, who nobody had heard of outside of physics before. After this, he was a, a household name. Okay. So when he wrote his theory of general relativity, remember, he was able to explain why Mercury was making these unusual motions. But he was also able to predict something that nobody had seen before, the deflection of starlight. Okay. He also predicted that if you had even more mass, something more interesting could happen. Suppose that you had a very strong mass here, and here's your star behind it. Uh, well, it's possible that there are two photons that make it to your eye. One travels this way and is bent there, and one travels this way and is bent there. Einstein said, you know what? You would see two images of the same star. It would be a mirage, right? There's only one there, but you can see it twice. Right? So he predicted that you know, around 1915 or 1920. And this was not found until 60 years later. 
So here's a picture, which I will admit is not a very spectacular picture, of two dots on the sky, which are labeled A and B. Uh, these are two dots on the, that are very close to each other on the sky. This is a Hubble Space Telescope picture. They're within 0 0.002 degrees of each other. Now that's not unusual for two stars to be nearby, but these are not stars. If you observe them carefully, these are a very rare object called quasars, which look like stars, uh, but uh, they're very sparse. So to have two of them right next to each other would be a very big coincidence. So the astronomers said, you know what, this might be one of these gravitational lenses, one of Einstein's images. And another clue that that's correct is you can see a, a very fuzzy blob here in the middle. That's a galaxy. And we need a galaxy to be there because somebody has to be bending the light if this is really a gravitational mirage. So maybe this is right. Maybe this gravitational lensing works. But I admit this is not totally convincing. And we also have to be a little careful because sometimes nature produces two things that look a lot alike. For instance, these are my identical twin suns, okay? Uh, and there are two of them. I can guarantee that this is not just a mirage, all right? So let me see. I can show you some more convincing cases of gravitational lensing, that there really is a mirage, not just two things. So here we have one of those clusters of galaxies that uh, Zwicky was looking at. These orangey blobs are all galaxies. And notice there's this funny looking galaxy here. It's, it's uh, ring shaped, right? Well, look, there's another ring shaped galaxy there, another one there, another one there, another one there, and there's actually another one there and another one there. Okay. You would never ever expect to see, these ring shaped galaxies are rare. You would never expect to see seven of them in the same place. Uh, so this is very clear evidence that this is a mirage, right? That the gravity of this cluster of galaxies is bending the light so that all these directions that we look, they all are pointing back actually to the same one ring-shaped galaxy behind it. And better yet, we know exactly how much the light had to be bent to do this. And Einstein gave us a formula that says, if the light is bent by this much, I'll tell you how many kilograms of mass there are there. And lo and behold, you do that calculation and you find there's five times as much or six times as much mass in this cluster as is visible in the normal matter, the gas and the stars. Okay. So we have once again found another footprint that so far we can only explain with this dark matter. Just for fun, uh, Einstein also predicted that if you got very lucky, such that there was a, uh, a galaxy or a star or something diametrically opposite the mass from you, that in fact any direction that you looked around the galaxy, the light was actually coming from that dot. And so to you, what you would see would be a ring of light surrounding this galaxy. So he predicted this again, you know, around 1920. And here is eight pictures out of what are now close to 100 known of these gravitational lenses where you have these rings or nearly complete rings around galaxies. This is gravitational lensing. And in every case, the size of the ring tells us how much dark matter must be there. Okay, and it all agrees. Uh, here's a nice one that I like, nearly total ring around a galaxy. And here's a very nice arc around a cluster of galaxies. And there's no way that this is, uh, galaxies just never look like this, right? This is so grossly distorted that it has to be gravitational lensing at work. Okay, here's a movie which I hope will run. Yes, okay. This is a simulation where we imagine that we have a bunch, a cluster of galaxies here with dark matter around it. And these blue galaxies are like a sheet of wallpaper that we're moving behind the cluster of galaxies. And as they move behind, the ones that would have passed right behind here get turned into these rings like you saw. Okay. So these rings are, you know, our sign that there's uh, a lot of matter here. But I just want you to notice that even up here, okay, these galaxies are not huge rings, but they're still being stretched a little bit by the lensing action of the matter. And let me make a cartoon version of this. Let's say that we had some wallpaper in the background that was covered with galaxies, but the galaxies are nice little colored circles like this, okay? And then I'm gonna put some a galaxy cluster or a galaxy in front of it that's going to start acting like a gravitational lens. 
Okay. Well, you can uh, solve Einstein's equations and see that this is what those galaxies would look like after they were lensed. And galaxy A that was lucky enough to be right behind the center of the mass turns into one of those rings, right? And you look at that and you go, oh, it's a beautiful gravitational lens, okay? And I can measure the mass with that. But you also notice that all these other galaxies here, they're not big rings, but they're each stretched a little bit, right? So even if you didn't see galaxy A here, but you saw all these other galaxies that were all aligned in a circle, you can also use that to tell that there's matter there, that there's dark matter. Okay. Now there's one problem with this method of locating the dark matter. Uh, well, I'll tell you first the good thing, which is that there's wallpaper everywhere. There's galaxies all over the sky. Right? So this method of looking for lined up galaxies right, works everywhere that you look, not just you don't have to be so lucky as to be right behind a big galaxy cluster or one of the biggest piles of mass in the universe. This is potentially a method to make a map of where the dark matter is everywhere on the sky, which would be a very nice way. You know, we need to learn more about the dark matter. Okay. The one thing that's a problem is that galaxies, the galaxy wallpaper does not look like this. Uh, it looks a little bit more like this, which is to say that the galaxies are not circles. They are born with many different shapes. Some are squashed, some are round, some are this way, some are this way, right? So if I look at one of these galaxies after the lensing works on it, say galaxy uh, H here, if I just see galaxy H, I can't be sure whether it's stretched like this because gravitational lensing did that, or maybe galaxy H was just born that way, right? So this is what we call weak lensing as opposed to strong lensing. This is strong lensing, right, galaxy A, where you say, oh yeah, that's a lens. But weak lensing, you look at one galaxy and you say, eh, I don't know, could be anything, right? So there's a way out of this problem though, which is that each galaxy is stretched a little bit. So if you went and measured many galaxies around here, what you would find is that they're more likely to be lined up this way than to be lined up this way, okay? There's, you have to take a census of a large number of galaxies and then see if there's no lensing, they'll just point in random directions. But gravitational lensing will make them have a slight tendency to line up with each other. Okay. And with that information, you can make a map of the dark matter in the universe. So to make this map, remember there's three things you have to do. You have to go and measure the shapes of galaxies in the wallpaper, distant galaxies on the sky. And number two is you need to do this with a lot of galaxies, okay? Because this is a very subtle signal and the galaxies have their own uh, lives to worry about. So you want to measure at least thousands and preferably many millions of galaxy shapes to do this, which you might imagine is a very tedious job. Okay? And then you analyze the alignments of these shapes and there's a formula that will let you turn that shape pattern into a map. And you might think that sounds very complicated, but actually you could do it, not even consciously. Okay? Uh, you can go and uh, look on the internet. Uh, this is from a catalog for what's called obscure glass. Right? And of course, this is what you would see on a shower stall or something, right? where you want to distort people's view of what's on the other side. And in this catalog, uh, there's all these different kinds of glass you can buy, and this shows you what it looks like, you know, what the flowers look like viewed through this glass. And I'm guessing that you could, for instance, just look at this picture and very quickly in your head, you can figure out what shape the glass had that made that distortion. So this is actually not too crazy an idea, right? That you can look at a distorted image and it tells you about the transparent stuff that's doing the distorting in between. That's exactly what we're gonna do, okay? Here's a first case of when this, uh, one of the most spectacular cases, not the first one, of using this weak gravitational lensing trick to make maps of dark matter. Uh, so here is a cluster of galaxies. You see lots of little galaxies here, okay? Uh, now, this cluster of galaxies, as I mentioned, most of them 
Most of the normal matter is in the form of a very hot gas that emits x-rays. So the pink here shows a picture taken by this x-ray telescope. This is showing us where the atoms are in this cluster of galaxies. And this is called the bullet cluster because it's got this funny shape here that uh, looks like a, a bullet of matter uh, is passing through. Okay. Then uh, our, our friend Doug Klo and his collaborators, they went and measured the shapes of several thousand of, you know, each of these faint little blotches here is a galaxy in the background. And we're going to measure the shapes and look for a pattern. And they were able to derive the blue is where the dark matter is. So what you see is something that's very stunning. Most of the matter is not in the place where the atoms are. So this is probably the single most convincing image to say that most of the matter is not atoms. It's something else. And remember that we were also considering the option that maybe the law of gravity needs to be changed. We don't need to just invent a new kind of matter that maybe it's just gravity that's wrong. This is very hard to do by changing the law of gravity, right? It's very hard to change the law of gravity such that the gravity seems to pile up in a different place from where the matter is. Okay? So this picture here essentially convinces us that there really is dark matter. It's not just that we have our theory wrong this time. Okay. All right, so we would like to keep doing more of this. And to do that, I and about 200 of my close friends and collaborators, some dozen of whom are from Barcelona and are scattered around the room here, uh, we got together to do an experiment on a very grand scale. Now this experiment does many things, but one of the things it does is make dark matter maps. Uh, so this is called the Dark Energy Survey, and it's a collaboration from people in the U.S., my institution here, and many places, uh, including several institutions here uh, in Barcelona and in Madrid. And uh, here we are at a meeting outside Barcelona uh, two years ago. Okay. You'll look around the room, you'll see some of the faces from this picture. Okay. And we need to take pictures, remember, of millions of galaxies. Well, to take pictures of a lot of galaxies, you want to get a camera that you can put on a telescope that will take a picture of as much of the sky as you can. Right? You want to do a lot of galaxies at a time. Doing them one by one, you'll never get through it. Okay? So our collaboration built this thing that has the somewhat uncreative name of dark energy camera. All right? And this camera is one of the largest digital cameras ever built. Uh, it's about this big. Okay? And it has 500 million pixels, so some 50 or so times more than the camera you're holding in your hand. Okay. Uh, by the way, to make that many pixels takes a lot of wires, so that's what the other side looks like. Uh, and I should mention that most of the electronics that were uh, used to run this camera were actually designed and fabricated in Spain. Okay. Now this camera is mounted on a telescope uh, in Chile, 4 meter telescope, and so the camera is here, and the light from the stars is coming from behind us, comes down and bounces off the mirror of the telescope, and then is recorded by the camera. Okay. Here's one of our first pictures when we first turned the camera on in 2012. And it's a picture that includes a bunch of these this yellowish blobs, which I hope by now uh, you'll recognize as one of the galaxy clusters. Remember that galaxy clusters are very large. Well, also in this picture are a whole bunch of little, tiny, faint background galaxies, several thousand of them. We can use them to do this mapping trick. And uh, also, before I get to that, uh, I'll just say that that galaxy cluster picture that you saw there, right, that's only a tiny fraction of one DCAM photograph or image of the sky. Right? This is all of our 500 million pixels. That picture that was a few hundred million light years across was just this part. Okay? So in one picture, the DCAM can record oh, something like 100,000 galaxy images. Well, that's not, uh, just to give you a sense of scale, the chunk, this is how big the moon would be if it were in that part of the sky. Right? So this can take a picture bigger than the moon in one shot, which is unusual for an astronomical camera. All right, so we're going to take this roughly hexagonal uh, picture and we're going to take a lot of them. Okay. Uh, 
we're going to take that hexagon and we're going to start taking many, many pictures across the sky. Okay? And uh, then we're going to take more and more and more pictures and we're going to cover an area of the sky that looks like a, a, a tank or something like that. Don't ask why it looks like this. Uh, but that area is going to cover one eighth of the entire visible sky by the time we're done. And so it's a five year project. We're going to take 100,000 pictures over five years. We're about halfway through right now. And by the time we're done, we're going to have pictures. We're going to measure the shapes of over 200 million galaxies. Okay. And obviously, nobody's going to sit down and do this, right? We have to write computer code that can do this automatically because no human could uh, stand the job of doing that many times. So as I said, here's one of our early pictures. And here is a map of the location of the matter in the vicinity of this galaxy cluster. Uh, so the colored contours here are showing you where the dark matter is. And the black dots are a visible galaxy. And what you can see is that the dark matter and the visible galaxies tend to be in the same place. Okay. So that's our first dark matter map from the Dark Energy Survey. Uh, now, in the very first few months that we turned it in, when we were you know, testing it out and everything, we took a smaller survey in the green area here. That's only 3% of the total area that we're going to cover eventually. This is the dark matter map, our practice map. Okay. This is just 3% of what we're going to see. So this is an area on the sky that's about the size of a constellation or something like that that you would identify. And in this map, the reddish regions are the directions where these galaxy distortions are telling us there's a lot of dark matter, a lot of mass in that direction. And the bluer regions are where the universe seems relatively empty. Okay. Now, if we go and look at the pictures that we took in those directions, if we look at this place where there's supposed to be a lot of mass, we actually see, yeah, there's a lot of galaxies there. Here's something where lensing told us there's a lot of mass. Yeah, there's a lot of galaxies. Here's what we call a void, a place where the lensing told us we, there's not much dark matter. Uh, yeah, there's not many galaxies there either. So maybe this isn't too surprising, you know, that the dark matter and the visible galaxies follow each other. And just to give you a little bit more, uh, another picture of that, uh, this is a very large scale picture over a billion light years across. Uh, the little gray circles here are the locations of visible clusters of galaxies, right? So now we're not just looking at one galaxy cluster at a time. We're looking at a much bigger swath of the universe uh, and we're, we're measuring, you know, hundreds or thousands of these galaxy clusters. And once again, you see that they pile up in the places where the lensing is telling us that there's mass, but they avoid the places where there's no dark matter. Okay. Now, the dark matter seems to be following the galaxies around. So that seems a little dull. Okay, we already knew there were galaxies there. But when you think about it, it's actually the other way around. Right? Who has the most gravity in the universe? It's not the normal matter, because the normal matter is only a sixth of it. It's the dark matter that drives the bus, right? The dark matter has the strongest gravity. I was hoping to show you enough evidence that you would come to believe that our invisible friend dark matter is real. Okay? So I've shown you two or three different footprints, right? The ways that we see, we don't see the dark matter directly, but we see it affect the things that we can see. Okay? And so perhaps you're convinced by that. Uh, and if we take that leap, we actually also are able to measure how much dark matter there is. And we see, we conclude through many different techniques, including some that I haven't even described yet, that there's five or six times more of this weird dark matter than all the normal stuff that we know anything about. And we even know where it is. We can make maps of where the dark matter is in the sky. And as I mentioned, we don't just know this, we actually need the dark matter now, right? Because it's the gravity of dark matter that forms the universe into the shape it has today. Okay. What do we know about the dark matter itself? So we, we know a fair bit about its effect on the, universe, on the other stuff in the universe, but 
actually we know almost nothing about the dark matter itself. We know a few nothings about it. We know what it doesn't do. We know that it doesn't emit or absorb photons, right? It never shines. It never casts a shadow, right? And we also know that it's extremely inert. It doesn't interact with protons and neutrons and electrons the way that normal things does do. It's, it's more like a neutrino in that it just shoots right past everything, right? right? Every second, there's millions of these particles passing through your body. And it doesn't seem to bother us, okay? And nobody has ever seen a sign of this dark matter in the laboratory yet. People are trying, and maybe, you know, in another year or two or decade or who knows what, uh, we will be able to say, here's the picture of a dark matter particle hitting a proton or something like that. But we just don't have that yet. Okay, so right now, it's almost total ignorance. All right, so that's the end of my story about uh, astrophysics. And I just want to see, you know, is there some closing thought that we can learn uh, from the history of dark matter as I've described it to you. And I think an important lesson is that we can miss a lot if we only focus on the things that are an obvious part of life, of our daily life. Right? You know, much can lie beyond our daily human experience. And it can take a combination of great imagination and careful observation to learn about things that are enormously different from what we're used to. So I think at least one lesson that we can learn, even though you'll probably, dark matter will never change your life, but at least maybe it can change the way you think about life in that we should be humble and maybe we should be looking for things that we can't see. Well, thank you. <laughs>